calendar an hour. Um, we're going to talk about identifying some common triggers for behaviors associated with dementia, as well as explaining the process for assessing and identifying challenging behaviors. I, if you want, I hopefully you have a notebook. You can take down some, jot down some notes as we go along. That would be fabulous. Um, and then I'm going to work with you on listing out some strategies to address some common dementia-related behavior. So I'll be talking to you about anxiety um, and agitation, and I'll be using a case study to kind of demonstrate some tips on what to, how to resolve the behavior, the problematic behavior, um, and what to look for in trying to address what's actually going on for the person with um, dementia. So I came a little late. Is everybody here to take care of somebody with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia? Uh, are there people here that have been diagnosed with the disease? Okay. Are you just here because you're concerned that you might get it? <laughs> oh, so hands back there. Yes, me too. Okay, great. <laughs> happen in a vacuum. Um, you know, we do things pretty much because of response, to a response of something, right? So if somebody pinches me, I might respond like, why did you pinch me? Or I might respond by hitting them. Or I might respond like yelling at them. Or maybe I don't even notice that they pinched me, okay? Something happened before my response, right? Before the behavioral response. Somebody pinched me, right? Something always happens before a behavior occurs, right? And we call that the, a trigger. Does that make sense? Okay. So whatever happens be before the behavior is a trigger. Sometimes we're able to identify these triggers, and sometimes we're at a total loss. Today I'm going to work with you on trying to identify some possible tr triggers to why behavior occurs. So sometimes for a person with, al with Alzheimer's disease, is this one better? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is my normal. 
Okay, so, but the first time it happened. It's scary. Because mm -hmm. a person can actually, with UTIs, you know, very, you know, a lot of different behaviors can happen. But usually, it's, it's disheartening because you have no idea what's going on, right? And the person might actually act out very aggressively. Um, cursing, yelling. Um, sometimes they will say, my stomach hurts. Or sometimes they will say, oh, I'm hungry. But really what's happening is that they have the UTI. Right? So pain or discomfort can trigger some challenging behaviors. Uh, overstimulation or boredom. I like calling overstimulation too much noise in the environment. So if I was up here giving this talk and we had strobe lights going on over my head, you probably, hopefully, wouldn't have a seizure, but you definitely would be distracted, right? Or if I was in um, a crowded restaurant with my loved one, um, with my father who has Alzheimer's disease, and I'm trying to get him to order from one of the menus. Who's got a big menu? Chili's? Does Chili's have a big menu? Um, I'm sorry? BJ's, is that what's around here? And then uh, the big one that has like 50 pages of stuff? Cheesecake Factory, that's like the Cheesecake Factory, right? Overwhelming to me, trying to pick, pick out something to eat. Can you imagine for the person with Alzheimer's disease that gets very confused? Trying to not only pick out something from um, the menu, but also being distracted by the noise in the room, right? With the, the glasses and people talking and the wait, wait stuff coming over every three minutes. Have you made a decision? Have you made a decision? Have you made a decision? So this kind of more overstimulation can also cause um, what I like to call a catastrophic reaction, right? Either the person might respond aggressively or they become more internalized, right? Um, and then you have kind of the other end of the spectrum, the boredom, right? When I'm bored, I typically want to take a nap, right? If I'm not doing something, I'm like, nap time, right? So if you don't have anything in the person's daily activities to keep them engaged, they can be understandably and bored, right? So it's important to find that happy balance between too much noise in the environment and not enough stimulation for that um, Another behavioral change, um, fear of frustration, right? Sometimes when you are in a strange environment, uh, it can take us a while to kind of acclimate to that, to that environment. Or if we're in a foreign country, right? Nobody speaks our language. It can be very frustrating. Right? To find out where the bathroom is, where you know, I got lost and where's my hotel room. For a person with the disease, that's the world that they're living in. Right? Everybody else is speaking a different language than the one that they're speaking. So a lot of fear and frustration can be displayed um, because they are really having a hard time making sense of the world that they're living in. Unfamiliar surroundings, coming into a new room. Or a room where there's a lot of people that they don't know will take them a while to acclimate. Um, and then complicated tasks. Things that we take for granted. Right? So how many people remember getting dressed this morning? How many people remember standing in front of their closet and trying to figure out what they were going to wear? OK, how many people are better planners than me and did it last night? OK, good, good job. Um, so, but if you, if you actually sit there and list out every step that you took to actually get ready for today, it would probably be close to 50, 60 steps. It's very complicated. <clears throat> how many people's closets are well organized? Okay, how many people have their stuff laying on the floor? Okay, right? So you have to go through all of that, right? Try to find the appropriate outfit for today. Right? You actually, if you have zippers, you have buttons, if you're going to wear socks, if you're going to wear pantyhose, if you're going to wear heels or slip-ons or whatever, right? There's a lot of choices that have to be made. And there's a lot of noise in that environment, in that closet. Maybe you have stuff in a dresser, maybe you have stuff in, in a hallway closet. It can be very, very complicated. 
right? So these complicated tasks for somebody with a disease, there's going to be mistakes. Right? How many people help somebody pick out their art? When you help them, are they able to actually put the clothes on themselves? Right? So you've eliminated some of this overstimulation, some of this noise. That's my first tip for you. Hopefully it's my best tip, maybe. Um, is limiting the noise, controlling the environment, making sure that you have set up a task for that person where they can accomplish it. Right? So you're not going to say, oh, dad has Alzheimer's disease. Oh, well, go pick out your outfit, go get dressed, and I expect you to be ready in 20 minutes. Right? That is never going to happen. Not even on a good day. But if you lay out the clothes, if you pick out the outfit, or even better yet, the person is still capable of making a choice. Right? Maybe you lay out two outfits and they pick out which one they can wear. Right? You're setting them up to be successful. Oftentimes we look at this disease as the per what the person's not able to do. Right? They can't do this, they can't do that, they can't do this, they can't do that. I'm challenging you to think about what are they still capable of doing? Right? Well, they're not capable of picking out their clothes, but maybe they're capable of putting on their on their shirt. Maybe they're not, not capable of buttoning their shirt. Okay, we're just not going to have shirts with buttons or do pullovers. Right? You want to set them up to be successful. You want to try to create an environment where they can they can participate in their care. Right? Because when you accomplish something, how does it make you feel? Good? Sleepy? Good? Can you jump up for joy? Sometimes? When other people accomplish stuff, can you jump up for joy? Yeah. So it makes you feel good. It makes you feel worth, right? And it also increases the person's self-worth and independence. It doesn't matter if you're doing 90% of the work and they're doing 10% of the work. As long as they can contribute in some level to their and it also can make your life a lot easier. Uh, and also distinguish some, and um, extinguish some of these behavioral challenges. Do you have any questions? Don't be scared, don't be shy. I will repeat it. I'll, hopefully I'll be able to hear you. Right? Because some of that comes from that fear 
comes from that frustration, and also, you know, some, some of it comes from the guilt of being ill. The other question I would ask is um, kind of around taking away the stigma around the disease. Would you talk to your mom about if she had breast cancer? Would you even question yourself about wanting to talk to her about it? Probably not, right? And a lot of it has to do with the stigma around the disease. And I believe maybe you talked a little bit about that this morning. Yes? No? Okay. But, you know, we don't talk about this disease. We're afraid to talk about it. And then, you know, new statistics came out this week that even people that are diagnosed with the disease, 42%? 45. 45, oh, even higher. 45% don't even know they have a diagnosis because the physician has a that, you know, if the physician didn't tell me I had cancer, what, you know, what's going to happen? You know, so there's a lot of stigma around the disease. I'm saying that, that yes, have the conversation with your loved one, but also know the environment that you are. You're, if the person, if you know, it's just going to frustrate them and make them angry, and then their response is, there's nothing wrong with me, which is sometimes the response. I'm fine, there's something wrong with you, then you probably don't want to have that conversation. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you're welcome. Any other question? Yes? Right? And then two days later, you're back to where you were before. 
right? So every day is a new day for them, every day is a new day for you, right? Um, you can drive yourself crazy trying to figure out how today is going to be, right? You can drive yourself crazy figuring out, you know, why is she doing this? We've done this a billion times. I don't understand, you know? Um, it's a new day for them. It's brand new information, even though it's happened a billion times before. So why don't we talk, about, I'm going to shift gears um, and talk about addressing, understanding and addressing the behavior. Um, there are kind of four tips, four more tips for you um, to think about when you're trying to figure out how am I going to deal with, um, you know, mom not eating? Or how am I going to deal with the fact that the person doesn't want to get dressed? How am I going to deal with, um, the fact that the person sleeps all day and is wandering around the house at night. How am I going to deal with um, the fact that my dad has a baby in a month? All of these tips can be applied to a number of different behavior problems. I won't have time to go through every one of the behavior problems that you might experience, but these tips will be able to help you try to figure out how am I going to um, address the behavior and how do I appropriately respond? All right, so we'll talk about detect and connect, um, address the physical needs first, uh, then the emotional needs, and then reassess and plan the next time. And the reason why we reassess and plan the next time is sometimes what you do to resolve the behavior problem works today, and then you fall flat on your face the next time because it doesn't work. Um, so what works today might not work tomorrow, but what works, you know, tomorrow maybe will work in, in another three years. Um, it's about being flexible as, as you go through this journey. So, um, detecting and, con and connecting. Um, another tip, I, and I tell this to my families a lot, is join the person in a his or her reality. This is the world that they live in. Um, an example would be, uh, I don't want Jim to come over because he always steals my money. Okay, one, that could be very well be true, but probably not, right? If you know Jim and you know Jim is not a thief, okay? So let's, let's just go with Jim is not a thief and Jim is not stealing money, right? But mom thinks that Jim is stealing the money. Your initial response would be to what? Mom, Jim is not stealing your money, right? You know, Jim would never do that. Jim's an honorable guy, right? That's what you would tell me, right? That's probably not something that you would tell a person with a disease and that they would understand, right? Because by, by responding in that way, what are you asking the person to do or be able to do? rationalize, right? And the person with this disease is unable to rationalize, right? They're unable to rationalize. But if you go there and say, hey, well, I don't think Jim would do that. Why don't we look around and try to find the money? Because nine times out of 10, they misplace the money. The other one out of 10 is that the money never was there to begin with. They're thinking about something that happened 30, 40 years ago, or never happened, right? But be in the reality with, and address the emotions that the person's feeling, right? They're angry, they're scared, they're frustrated, and they don't really understand what is happening. How many people have loved ones that are suspicious like that? And how, oh. Mary? Oh, no glasses yet. And how did you respond to that? I just go along with it. Go along with it. It's an easier ride to go along, right? Because you end up, when you're trying to reason with the person, you end up getting frustrated yourself. I, I try and show compassion and just mm -hmm. go along. Compassion and go along. Because next 
Next, yeah. Go for the ride. Who else raised their hand? They're like, nobody else. I saw all these hands go up. <laughs> no. Yeah, and, and the, the, the repetitiveness of it can be taxing um, on, on you. Um, and then maybe it'll go away for a couple more days, and then they'll bring it back up. Um, or five more minutes, or what have you. So um, redirection is always very helpful. Um, it might not last long. I'm not, not going to lie to you. Um, but redirecting the person of, you know what, I, I don't remember seeing that, but let me look for it. Or even taking the blame yourself. Oh, you know what, I did do that. I am so sorry. I will go fix it right now, whatever that may be. Right? Let's go do a puzzle. Or, oh, you know what, I need to do some stuff downstairs if you want to help me. Or, you know, coming up with another task. So having an arsenal of different activities or ideas to distract the person with can be helpful to kind of get them out of that agitated state. Redirection will be your best friend. Um, so understand the person's reality kind of in context in the, in the who, what, where, when, how. Uh, that really has to do with, you know, who, there could be somebody in the room with them or some other person that might be causing a trigger, causing a behavior. Um, it could be the environment that they're in, the where, the what could be, what am I actually dealing with? Am I really dealing with the fact that there's money missing or the book is missing or I'm dealing with the fact that she's confused or he's confused? Um, and then when? When, is it, when are these behaviors occurring? Are they always occurring at night? Are they occurring in the afternoon? Are they occurring in the morning? Sometimes the time of day can cause um, a behavioral response. Right? We see a lot more behavior, troublesome behaviors in the evening. We call it sundowning. Does anybody feel with sundown? So the person might be a little better mid-morning, that's probably the best time of day for them, but by 3 o'clock you start seeing maybe they're getting tired, or maybe they're getting more agitated, or maybe they're getting more repetitive. Um, so, you know, between 10 and 2, I'm making that up. The 10 and 2, but like mid-morning is really the best time for the person. That's probably the best time to schedule doctor's appointments, the best time to get them to do things that you need them to do in order for them to be properly. Um, and then how do you do something, right? How, how are, how is information being relayed to the person with the disease, right? So I can come in, like today, for example, I, it took me about an hour and a half to get here, right? But I sat in my car for 15 minutes because I hate people, right? Because there's way too many trucks and nobody uses their phones. And it really drives me crazy. That's my pet peeve. Right? So I'm not going to walk in here all agitated because, you know, it took me forever to get here and nobody should be driving except for me. Um, <laughs> so I'm not, you know, but I sat in my car before I walked in to, you know, pull my stuff together and be, the, you know, the pleasant person that I am right now before you. Okay? So, however, if I did walk in, I could, I think it pretty well. If I did walk in, um, and still was a pleasant person before you, there might be a little edge to me still that I might not be aware of. Right? So you you might be you might be contributing to some of these behaviors, right? So if you're coming at the at the person, um, agitated or frustrated or annoyed or stressed or tired, they're gonna pick up on that. Right? So it's one thing for me to say, Mary, I, you know, I think it's time for us. We have to go to the doctor's now. I'm sorry, I totally forgot about it. You know, I, you know, you're dressed. We should just get done over with, and we'll go get my stamp. Right? Because apparently I've heard that my student is the best friend of everybody. 
read your nonverbal cues that you're uncomfortable, and I start taking off your clothes, right? Um, so I might want to coach you differently, right? If in fact it is time, you know, it's been two months since we were able to get you into the back, right? Um, so I might, I don't know you, I, I know you, but I can't remember your name. Elaine. So I might approach you differently. I might say, hey, Elaine, you think it's time for us to be um, no wash up? You know, can you walk into the bathroom? You know, where's your, you know, can you take me to your bathroom? Might sit you down, might take out a sponge and say, we're going to use this, and, and then this is the soap that we're going to use. I might go through the process. You might not understand the steps of, you know, what the sponge is, and here's the soap. But I will go through each step with you to try to give you a little bit more at ease, right? Bathing is a very complicated task to complete with the person. It's a very intimate activity to do. So you want to proceed with caution. You want to um, proceed with trying to um, have that person's dignity remain intact, right? So going through those steps and going slow, you'll have better results. Bathing is also a thing that you don't need to do everything. Right? Sometimes we get hung up on our own ideas of what needs to be done, how it needs to go, when it needs to be done. Right? Uh, you know, I tell my family, you have, we get three pet peeves, so choose them wisely and give up the rest. Right? Mine is a toilet paper. It has to go on a circle. Okay? It drives me crazy when it doesn't. Right? I know it's ridiculous, but that's my pet I have two others, but yeah, say those to later. <laughs> but you know, there, there are some things that have to go a certain way. Um, bathing does not have to go a certain way. Certain things need to get done, but they don't necessarily need to get done all at the same time. Right? So maybe we don't wash hair and do bathing at the same time. Maybe we wash hair once a week or once every two weeks on a different day. And then, or maybe take the person to the barber and they can wash them and get their hair right? And then maybe we do a little sponge baths in between, you know, actually submerging the person in water. Um, there's all these different things that you can do, but it's also letting go of some of your own hang-ups on, well, mom always saved every day. She always set her hair out of that. Right? She always worked on this thing. Right? She always worked on this. You know, I still want her to, to do these things. But the question I raise to you is, if those things are agitating the person when you're trying to do them, why are you doing it? The person is becoming more and more uncomfortable doing those things. Why are we forcing them to do it? Because they lose and you lose. Um, use your knowledge of the person's preferences to provide effective interventions. So if a person is more inclined to um, kind of, I don't want to say, obey you, but they're more receptive to you in a certain surrounding. So if the bedroom, bedrooms tend to be People are a little bit more inclined, I don't want to say submit, but I'm going to say submit to, to, um, to what you need them to do if they're in that familiar surrounding, if they feel sick. So finding a safe environment for them um, when you need to dispense medications or if you're going to address them or if you need them to do something um, and not, some, not the bathroom is probably not the place to ask them to take their medication. Right, if they're already fearful of that. Right, maybe the bar or maybe the living room is an environment that they're more inclined to take the medication. Um, redirect energy into a more soothing activity. So again, this is kind of your arsenal uh, to go uh, things for the person to do. Uh, redirect your if your if your loved one. I keep using moms. I don't know why. But we'll, we'll switch to dads. Who's got a dad that has the disease? No? Does your dad have an activity that he loves to do? You know, he's early onset, early onset diagnosis. 
So what's an activity, what's one of the activities that you think he's probably not going to be able to do in a couple of years? Cooking. Cooking. Yeah. So he cooks the whole meal. He used it. He, he used it. Really so what does he do in the kitchen? We give him things to chop. Okay. And he eats a great deal of So when he eats, okay. So that's an example. So an example of a soothing activity, even though the person might not be able to complete the entire task, like cooking requires a lot of different steps in order to kind of accomplish that task, they can, they can participate in part of it, whether it's chopping or whether it's you know, breaking out the silverware or setting a table. Um, the activity of cooking might not actually be about cooking, but about the connection that we make with people that we cook for. Right? And so being in that environment might just be the soothing activity. So even if that progresses and no longer can chop, right? Doesn't mean that you can't be in the kitchen um, as you're cooking, as you're having a conversation with them. Does that make sense? So the reassess the plan for the next step. Um, sometimes we cannot figure out what the trigger is for the behavior, right? Sometimes we've gone through, you know, all the little list of, is it the environment? Is it uh, medication? Is it a urinary tract infection? Is it me? You know, am I the cause of the problem? And we have no answer. Oftentimes that can be the case. So trying to go back and figure out, okay, what's going on, what's causing the problem, you might not be able to do. But you can change how you react, right? So if you approach the problem and you're advocating angry about it all the time, what do you think is going to happen? The person is going to forget that you're angry at them, but you're going to remember, right? And either you're going to feel guilty about it, you're going to beat yourself up over it, oh, I should have that differently, what have you. You're going to carry that on until the next time there's a problem, right? But if you approach it as, eh, so he's wearing the same outfit five days in a row, not the end of the world, right? At least he's able to put a shirt on, right? Okay, so he's eating ice cream every night. Okay. Oh, we don't want that, but really, in the scheme of things, not the end of the world. Right? Sometimes our own hang-ups cause the behaviors to go wrong, right? And because we can't change that behavior. Well, hide these things, they tend to find them. I don't know how they do, but they find the cookies, right? Um, so, but your approach to it, right? At the end of the day, if you're like, I don't care. You feel so much better, right? But so, so often, we put so much time and energy into wanting to make it perfect when it really doesn't need to be. And sometimes we make it more difficult than it really has to be. And that's hard. It's hard to reflect on your own stuff. I like to call it your own prince. Right? Because we all have it. It's really hard to reflect on it, and it's hard to let go of um, But I'm telling you, you'll do yourself Oh, well, if, you, if you're able to let go of some of this. You get three pet things, right? Or I write you three. But letting go of some of those hangouts, life will be a little bit more. Again, join that person's reality. What went well? What didn't go well? When you did approach the problem? Um, and then how can you make adjustments? How can I approach this differently? What can I do? What can I do differently? to make it easier for all involved. A lot of times, talking to other family members, um, not your blood kin relationship, but going to support groups and meeting with other families that, are, that have experienced this or will experience this in the future can be extremely beneficial in making, making sure that you feel that you're connected and you're getting support.
Sometimes they might have an answer. Sometimes they've gone through this and know what to do and how to kind of handle that situation. That doesn't mean what they did will work for your, for your loved one. But again, having those tools and other resources. Oh, I tried this, didn't, this didn't work. Oh, I'm going to try what said. Okay, well, she's crazy. That didn't work. You know, but what Eric said worked. You know, it's working right now, and I'm going to continue to, to actually implement this. Um, and it's also a place for you to go where you don't feel alone. Right? Oftentimes, you're in this journey by yourself. Or it feels that way, right? It feels that nobody understands. Your best friend doesn't have a clue. Your brother that lives in New York is too busy telling you how to do things, but never comes out to visit, right? Your father or your mother, your, your mother or father, you know, they're not telling you enough information because they don't want to burden you, right? So all these things can kind of collide into one another where you can feel completely lost, right? So meeting with other people that are, that are going through this journey can be very beneficial in helping you kind of reach the end of the journey. Because your number one job, I know Gary's probably sitting here to say this, but your number one job, with a couple, we'll say three. There's three key points in caregiving, right? To make sure that person doesn't set themselves on fire, okay? To take care of yourself so that you can have the other person that can take care of you. That's your goal. All the other stuff is still. Right? If you can get down to take a bath twice a week, good on you. Right? If they're able to dress themselves, great. Right? But you have to reserve that energy for the long haul. This is not something that has an expiration date of two months. Right? People live with this disease for a long time. So, again, a lot of the things that we do, we might have to sit back and reflect on. Am I contributing to the behavior, and how can I either respond to it appropriately or give us support? So I have a couple more minutes before I get kicked off the stage. Oh, well, you're fine now. Yeah. yeah, she's got some bills on, so that's going to hurt. Susan? Look, her teeth are falling out. 
I just need you to do a quick exam. I need her to be in and out, you know, and then you can tell me what we should do. Should we do denture? Should we do pull up? You know, is this forget about it, it's not the end of the world, and everything will be fine. Because we don't want her to have gum disease, we don't want her to get an infection. You know, we want to try to you know, keep it as clean as possible. Are there other things you can do at home? But the point is, again, it's we give that person too much information, right? And they're going to be resistant. A mobile dentistry might come to the house. You have that here? Miss Alana? Go right over there. She's, open. She's like, how did this woman who's standing up there not know I was a mobile dentist? <laughs> there you go. I didn't know, you, I didn't know there was mobile dentistry up there. That's awesome. One more. Did I get the right answer? Mobile dentistry? Can I give her the right answer? She's like, Okay, I'm getting kicked off. Thank you so much.